Let's go to Job. Let's take a look at Job chapter 22, uh, and we're going to start in verses 21, and we're going to read down through uh, 28. Here, now yield. I'm reading in the Amplified, okay, but in any version you want. Uh, do me a favor. Also, share this broadcast, if you will, for those streaming. If you want to go to your social media pages, just click share. The more you share, the more people see and hear uh, the word of the Lord. So I want to encourage you to get on your phones and do that, okay? Now, yield. So this is Job 22 and starting in verse 21. Now, yield and submit yourself to him, meaning God, and be at peace. In this way... Good will come to you and you'll prosper. Notice, when I yield and submit to God, then peace comes. If you need peace in your life, if you need peace, that stillness, that confident assurance that Christ has it, he's taking care of it, it's all in him, because of him, through him, by him, for him, then I have to submit myself to him and I yield Yielding is one of the things that we struggle with as Christians. To yield means uh, uh, I stop and wait for the other person to go in front of me. If I'm yielding to the Holy Spirit, that means I went, oh, wait, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what you are leading me to do. To submit to God. It, 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 James tells us, submit to God and resist the devil, right? Right? Submit to God and to resist the devil. To resist that word, we've done a study on that before. That word in the Greek, resist, literally means to go the opposite direction of, to go in an opposing direction. So many believers, not knowingly, end up going the opposite direction of what God wants to do in their lives because they're not submitted. And, and they're supposed to submit to God and resist means actively change direction and say, I'm not going to go with you. I'm not walking with you. A meaning the world, the devil, my flesh. Remember, your flesh wars against your spirit. Paul said, the thing that I want to do most is the thing that I don't do. But my flesh is not my friend. Paul said, I have to beat my flesh. In other words, my flesh is stubborn like a mule. And I got to kick it and I got to whip it and I got to beat it and tell it what it's going to do. We now are, we are spirits and always have been, but we are brand new creatures in Christ. My body didn't be, be, get made brand new the day that I got saved. My spiritual man was reborn and I became brand new. Unless you're born again, you shall not enter the kingdom or see the kingdom. So I'm born again in here, but my, this mule that I'm walking around with that sits down and wants to do his thing his way, I've got to beat it and bring it into subjection. Because now my spiritual man is in charge. And I'm either yielding to my spirit or I'm yielding to my flesh at all times. So I want to challenge you today. Let's keep going. Be at peace. How am I at peace? Notice peace comes from submitting to God. Isaiah 26, 3 says this. You will keep him in perfect peace. Who what? Finish the verse. Whose mind is stayed, meaning fixed, steadfast upon what? Upon the problem, upon the issues, upon the people, upon my, my inability, my insufficiency, upon him. I have to keep my eyes and my inclination and my mind fixed on Christ. Fixing our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking away from all that does what? Distracts. I can tell you as a pastor, there are a thousand things a week that want my attention. That are distractions that the enemy will bring in your life to get you off of the main thing. I told you, Satan loves to start a bunch of dumpster fires in your life. That's the way I like to describe it. Because a fire that's happening in a dumpster is not something that I need to concern myself with. First of all, it's in a metal container, and it's trash, right? And it's garbage. Somebody else can handle the dumpster fires. My responsibility is the gospel. 
you will find yourself starting out in your week trying to do the right thing. And because you will let yourself be pulled by every distraction that comes your way. Next thing you know, at the end of the week, you didn't really get in the word the way you wanted. You didn't spend time with God the way you wanted. You're starting over again. God, I'm going to do different this week. Now, there is no condemnation in Christ, but let's not be confused. God is a jealous God. He's a jealous God. We forget that he's jealous, jealous for his own glory, jealous because he deserves to be worshiped. So if I give anything place in my life above God, then it's an idol. Now, we would never bow down to stone or hay or wood or or precious metals, right, in our culture. And yet, Constantly, we find ourselves being pulled away by distractions that have now taken, even unintentionally, I allow idols to come in and take away and draw away my attention from God because I gave more time to that thing this week than I did to him. Our problems don't seem that significant when we, when we pair them against the holy and righteous and all-glorious God. If your problem isn't as big as a dead Messiah then it's not a big problem because Jesus Christ was crucified. This is the savior of the world. He was hung on a cross. He was dead and buried. All of hell was laughing and chuckling and having a blast. And yet God, because he's so high, I said this the other day, God is playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers, right? And that's not even really a good comparison because chess and checkers are are two games we can both comprehend. We can't even comprehend the wisdom and the mind and the majesty and the glory of God. And yet by the Holy Spirit, he imparts to us the knowledge of the one who's high above all. So here I have to yield and submit myself so what? I can be at peace. Notice then in this way, having yielded and submitted yourself, then good will come to you. Do you know the end result of submitting to God is good? The end result of submitting to God in my life is prosperity comes my way. Please receive, verse 22, please receive the law and instruction from his mouth and establish his words in your heart and keep them. What does Psalm 119 say? Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? sin against you. Now, remember what Romans 14, 23 says. I want you to change your perspective of sin. Sin, some of us are are, are living our lives in such a way that we're pursuing holiness and the things that used to weigh us down don't weigh us down anymore because you've gotten victory over those things. So when you think of sin, don't just look out there at some sinner in the world. Look at what sin actually is biblically defined. Anything that doesn't proceed forth from faith in my life. Romans 14, 23. It'll shift your perspective. So in other words, I have just sinned when I made a decision, an action, took an attitude, said something that proceeded forth out of fear, out of doubt, out of worry, out of anxiety, out of anything other than confident assurance that God is on the job and he's a rewarder of me who diligently am seeking him. Sin is anything that doesn't proceed forth from faith. So I have to establish in my life, okay, what that is. Now, sin is missing the mark. Why? It is impossible to please God without faith. So it is impossible to please God. In other words, when I don't have faith, I miss the mark, right? And what is the mark? It's faith. It's the only way I obtain and receive perfection. There's nothing in my flesh that's any good. It says in Romans, there's nothing in me that's perfect. And yet by faith, I am perfected in and through Christ Jesus. He is the perfect spotless lamb of God. I can never be good enough to be accepted and welcomed and loved by God the Father. I had to have a a savior come in and do what I could never do and fulfill the righteous requirements of the law and then set me free from the law of sin and death. And because he has, now I can have uh, perfection in and through him. But I have to do what? I have to establish his word in my heart and notice, then it says, and keep them. Because having the word and obeying the word are two different things. Okay? 
A lot of people know the word, but they don't obey the word. Jesus said the evidence of your love. So we say, oh, we love you, Jesus. He says, if you love me, if is you, if there's something to prove after if. If you, I'll see. In other words, Jesus says, if you really love me, you'll do what? Obey. You'll obey me. So we have, a, we have a country full of believers who don't obey, right? There's so many people out there who love Jesus, right? But they don't obey Jesus. Now, the Bible says Jesus spoke a lot more harshly than we do today, by the way, right? He had a couple mean tweets in his time, right? He had a couple mean tweets. You brood of vipers, okay? You hypocrite. You play actor. You stage actor. You're up on stage acting, and then you take your costume off and you go home. That's what he was saying to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders of the day. That's what the word means. So I got to establish his word. I got to keep it. Then watch, and this is where we're headed. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. I don't know about you, but there are things in my life I'm believing God to build up. How do I make sure that that happens? By returning with all my heart in every little way and throughout my day to the Almighty. There are ways that we turn away and we don't even realize it. And then days later, we got to come back and go, God, I just I, return to the almighty. He's not saying you prodigals of the land who walked off for years and you've been living frivolously in pig pens. No, this is return in your thinking, return in your heart, return in your mind, return in your actions to the Lord. And then you will be built up. You got to receive by faith the word and then by faith the reward. Faith without expectation of reward is not faith. Two things are required for faith. I have to believe that he is. And number two, it's not enough to believe that he is. Number two is I have to believe that he is a rewarder. So if you're not believing God to build you up as you've returned to him or to be at peace as you submit to him or that good will come to you when you do, then you're missing faith. You have to believe God for it because he said it before you see it. So only when I believe him ahead of what I see will I see. Faith is the substance of things that I'm hoping for, the evidence not seen. If I see it, see, most of the time we want God to do it and then we'll believe it. That's just the way human nature works. The problem with that is that's not faith. Faith believes before you see. Some of you are having a difficult time in areas of your life that you're believing God and you say, well, God, this part of my life isn't lined up with what your word says. Keep believing. Keep having faith. Keep being confident that God's word is true and that it will come to pass in your life. Don't lose your faith. Don't grow weary in well-doing or in due season, you'll reap. If you, if you give up your faith, don't cast away your faith, in other words. The word says over and over again. So return to the Almighty. He'll build you up. Remove unrighteousness far from your tents. Unrighteousness, again, is what? Sin. And what is sin? Anything, right, that doesn't line up with faith. Now, and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir. Among the stones. Ophir, that's how you pronounce it in, in the language. Now, Ophir was the land of gold in the scriptures. They don't know exactly the place, but this was the place where Solomon derived gold for the temple. It, it, it's used over 13 times in the Old Testament in the King James. This word, this city, this area, this region is the place where all the gold, the valuable gold, was traded and it was brought. Okay? In other words, so think of it like this. And the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brook. So he's saying, place your gold in the dust, because that's what it's worth. Anything you've put your confidence in is worth dust. What is your gold today? What areas of your life have you put confidence in your resources, in your security, in your stuff, and it hasn't been in the Almighty? 
Because there are things in our lives that we have to challenge ourselves with on a consistent basis where we see. Now, the gold, put it among the stones of the brooks. In other words, considering it of little value. Remember what Paul said. Paul said, everything in my life that was worth something to me, that was valuable to me, that was significant to me, that was, that was special, I count it as loss for the surpassing knowledge of the greatness of knowing Christ. And watch, I love what he says next. And that's really the, the emphasis here today is verse 25. And make the Almighty your gold. And, and your precious silver. And then you will have delight in the Almighty and you will lift up your face to God. You will pray to him and he will hear you. Do you want confidence that when you pray to God, you know that he hears you? Make him your gold. Make him your precious silver. Make him more valuable than anything else in your life. I can tell you whether God is your gold by, by looking at your financial statements, your giving statements. And I don't mean here at the church. I mean, if, if you were to open up your, your giving to me, your finances in your personal life, I could tell you whether or not God is your gold and your silver. I could tell you by your browsing history, whether God is your gold or your silver. I could tell you by what you spend your time on at home. I could tell you whether God is your gold or silver. In other words, remember what Jesus said. See, you've done all these good things. You've done all these good things. Yet this one thing, the most preeminent thing you've left and you forgot. And that is what? And that is your first love. That song, by the way, that we were singing, Lord, you're beautiful. There's, a, there's another refrain in there. And it says, uh, return me to my first love. Right? Let the flame of my first love be ignited again in that sense, right? We always have to challenge ourselves to make God our gold and our silver. I love that. Think about that. The most valuable thing in your life is Christ. If I have Christ, I have everything. And I've been telling you, I've been challenging you this year to look at Christ as who he is in your life. And that is your promised land. Why are we always looking externally for the promise to eventually one day we'll cross the... We're not in the Old Testament. We're not living under the Old Covenant. Why are you still trying to cross the Jordan and get out of your Egypt and finally one day make it to the land flowing with milk and honey? Is not the land flowing with milk and honey the Messiah himself? who dwells in me by the spirit of the living God? Is not he my gold? Is not he the honey and the milk and the fat and the good of the land? Have not my tent poles been extended and my territory expanded because of Christ in me? Am I still under the old covenant? See, we want to have faith in the new covenant, and yet we still preach like we're in the old. We still believe like we're in the old because it sermonizes well. Trust me. I understand the analogy and the reference to us coming out, possessing the land. All that makes sense. Don't get me wrong. I understand all the figuratives. But people actually begin to believe that, that, that if they can just get over there, then if they're going to get in their promised land. And I said this the other day. I put, I, I put up a short from one of our messages and, and that is, they believe and believe and believe and believe and finally get there and they're still not happy. They're believing for the next thing already. Because Paul said, I learned to be content in whatever state I am in. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to be satisfied with that as the end. I, I'm always believing that God, remember, think big. We're believing God to expand and to grow. He's a God of increase. You should be believing every year every week, every month to increase. Why? Because he's a God of increase. That's all very biblical. That's believing that he will reward me. But I also have to learn Christian maturity. And that is, watch, if I make God my gold and my precious silver, then watch what happens. Then I will have the light in the almighty. All of a sudden, look, your joy is in him. The joy of the Lord is our strength. His joy. Yeah, come on. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I don't know about you, but I need joy sometimes. This is the season of joy, by the way. 
right? Christmas time, it's an exciting season. For some people, it's not very joyous because they think about bad things that have happened in their life and tragedies and traumas and other things. Let me tell you, there will always be a reason to not walk in joy in your life. There will always be a reason in the natural to not come into agreement with God's joy in your life as long as your focus is on anything other than him being your gold. The minute I determine that he's my gold, he's my silver, then I begin to delight in what? In my circumstances and everything I'm facing. Remember, the Bible says give thanks in all things, not for all things. It didn't say give thanks for everything. Thank God. It didn't say give thanks for it. It said give thanks in it, right? But then, let's watch. How can I give thanks in it if my focus is on all the problems? Jesus said sufficient for the day. So even when you think everything's going smooth in your life, because there's places we get where we feel like everything's just smooth, and that's great. We need seasons like that as much as we, God brings the testing and the trial to refine us. By the way, in Job 23, he says, he knows the way I take, and when he has tried me, I will come forth refined as gold. When he tries me, try me, that word literally implies trying the purity of metals, precious metals, which is how, how they would determine uh, the value of a precious metal. So when I make him my gold and my silver, then I'll have delight in the Almighty, and I'll lift up my face. Do you know when you begin to make God your gold and you begin to make God your silver, the way you treat people changes? The way you act when people treat you wrong changes. I'm no longer needing to get back at you, worried about what you said or what you did. Why? Because God is my gold, and I want to please my God. Our aim, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, is to be pleasing to him. So my attitude when God, when I'm delighting in God, do what you want to do to me. And it doesn't change because my perspective is on delighting in the Almighty. That's why Paul and Silas could praise and sing and worship in prison. By the way, they were in stocks. They were not, it wasn't like they were in a comfortable prison. They were literally bound in stocks and like crunched down like this. It was terrible. Now, I don't know about you. I could barely sing like this. Glory to the Lord. They were praising God. Paul was in a place that most people never get. And that is he had made his delight in the Almighty. Paul didn't just preach it. Paul lived it. Paul said, I've counted everything as loss. Everything is worthless. It doesn't mean I don't value relationships. It doesn't mean I don't work hard at my business. It doesn't mean I don't try my best to be a good parent or a good spouse or a good minister. It just means at the end of the day, the top priority of my heart is coming to the Lord and making him my value and saying, God, if all I have is you, I have everything I need. And let me say this to you. Leslie and I were talking about this the other day. When you get to the place, you've probably been there before in seasons of your life. When you get to the place where you don't need that thing to happen, where you don't need that breakthrough so desperately, because some of y'all are wanting breakthrough more than you want God. Some of you are believing for breakthrough more than you're believing for God. And when you make breakthrough, see, there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I need this to break through. God, I'm dealing with this giant. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is some people make their breakthrough more important than God. My breakthrough is my gold, God. If I just get my breakthrough, I'll be happy. And God the whole time is saying, what about me? Is it, is it not me that you delight in, son? Is it not me that's valuable and special and significant to you? What happens if you don't get your breakthrough? What happens if I don't come through for you the way you think I should on this issue? We know what happens to many people. They get bitter. They get upset. Why? Why? Because I have faith in you as long as you do what I need you to do. I have faith in you as long as you do it the way that I need you to do it. And I'll tell you, God rarely ever does it the way that you think he should do it. But he will always come through. So our confidence is, God, I don't know how. You are going to choose to show up strong on my behalf on this one, but I trust you that you are and that you will. And I'm going to trust your timing because I'm not going to get bitter and bent out of shape if it doesn't happen right away. 
I'm going to trust you that you're perfect and your motive toward me is perfect. And so I'm believing you. Your word says you're a rewarder. And I believe in your reward. I believe in your reward. So I'm going to, uh, it, there is, that is where your treasure is. It's okay to grab a hold of the reward. See, God is a rewarder. But so many times we make faith the point instead of God, our faith in God the point. Or we make our breakthrough what we're really, don't pursue breakthrough more than you pursue the God of the breakthrough. See, if, if all you do is pursue your breakthrough, okay, the minute you get your breakthrough, not only are you not really satisfied because your satisfaction was not in contentment in who he is, but, but the other side of that is then you fall out of relationship with God anyway because he broke through. Thank you, God. Now I don't, I don't know what to talk to you about anymore. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do because this is what I desperately made my gold. And let me say this and let me encourage you as we close. When you make God your gold, what God, remember what Jesus' words are. Now, these are powerful words. This is our Lord's words. He said, if you will make me your gold and your silver, all these other things, I'll add to you. If you will seek me first and my kingdom and my righteousness, everything else. Now, that's a hard place for us in the flesh. That's why our flesh is not our friend. Because I need to go to God about this issue and this issue, and we really got to talk this out, and I need some details, God. I need to know some time frames. I need to know, do you understand what I'm going through? Right? Whatever it is in the flesh, all that gets gratified and makes us feel temporarily better, but guess what? None of that is making God our goal. Do you know that Jesus promises, if you will make him your gold, so this week, the challenge is what? The practical challenge is it's December. We're celebrating the season of the birth of our Lord. Even though he wasn't born in December, we teach on that. We talk about when he was born. Uh, uh, but I encourage you, and you can go back and watch the Feast of Tabernacles message we have on YouTube where we talk about the birth of Jesus. But uh, we do celebrate in our Gregorian calendars the birth of Jesus during the season. So this is a season where we gather around with our families and we fellowship and have good times and do all that good stuff. And it's so important. Just make him your gold. Make him your gold with your spouse. How many spouses in here are praying with your spouse on a consistent basis? I want to challenge you this week to begin to say, hey, honey, let's just pray. Let's just go to the Lord together because you get out of that habit. How many of you parents are praying with your kids, right? Adult kids, children, doesn't matter. How many of you are making prayer a priority in your home? Because what I model, it's not enough. I've learned this. It's not enough for me to just go off and be with the Lord quietly and privately because I, I like to do that. It's I have to gather my family and say, hey, we're going to study the word together. We're going to pray together so they can actively see and hear dad. Because I go and pray in secret, right, which is a principle, and yet I'm training children. So parents, I want to encourage you this week, make God your gold. That means turn off Netflix, right? Not, a, not, not forever, just long enough to spend time with God and to focus on God. Who's more important, Elf or Jesus, right? That new Christmas movie out or Jesus, right? Okay? Okay. Y'all have all seen that movie enough anyway. It's funny. Okay, we love it. Okay, so make God your gold this week. Make him your silver. Make him your value. And let me tell you, if I make him my gold, I'll have more than enough gold. If I make him my gold, I'll have what I need. Why? Because he says, if you seek me above all these other things, then all the things. Remember what Solomon did? He asked for the principal thing and he got everything else. So if you just shift your focus, because we're all guilty of it, shift your focus this week and go, okay, God, in the ways, look, that means there are going to be times you get with the Lord and you say, God, I'm not going to bring you any list. I'm not going to tell you all this stuff. You already know what's on my heart. I'm just going to sit before you and worship you and tell you I love you and you're my gold and you're significant and I love your word and I'm thankful that you're creating in me a hunger for your word. Remember, all this is by faith. All of this, God will stir up hungers in you that don't even exist today. 
if you just ask him and you surrender and you submit yourself, right? So do that this week and let him be who and what he is. And then all these other things, open doors, they're going to come in the person of Jesus Christ. All your provision already exists in the person of Jesus Christ. Your healing in the person of Jesus Christ. Everything we have is because of him.